Uh, should I just go into uh, introducing the book a little bit, Amanda? And, and by the way, I'd love to know uh, whenever you contribute to the discussion, I'd love to know if you have read the book or if you've read a little bit of it, because you know we, we always say you're totally invited to participate in the discussion if you haven't read the book and, and that is totally fine. And I'd, I'd love to just honestly know uh, uh, you know, just for my own curiosity, honestly, have you read it? Have you read the whole thing or, or parts of it? And and what what did you uh, uh, well, what did you think of it? Uh, Carol Anderson is a professor of African American studies at Emory in Atlanta, and she's really best known for her previous book uh, called White Rage, uh, which sprang out of the, the, uh, the violence in Ferguson, Missouri uh, in uh, 20, 20, what was it, 2013, 14, 15. Uh, and that book uh, really kind of made her a, a celebrity of sorts. And it was a New York Times bestseller and it, and it really elevated her into the public conversation far more than most academics. Uh, and one person no vote is, as Amanda already said, a very current events book about, uh, you know, there is what, it starts off with one chapter that does cover the history and the history of, of Jim Crow and the so-called Mississippi plan and, and uh, disenfranchisement going back to reconstruction. But the, but the bulk of the book is, takes place after 2013 and really in the, in the recent past and goes right up to the 2018 midterm elections. Uh, and, you know, as Amanda said, recent events, particularly the law that was passed in Georgia, uh, it would be, would fit in very well uh, in the Carol Anderson book. It's all of a piece with things that have been happening uh, in the last few years. Yeah, I think on her Twitter, um that the, uh, one of the retweets that she has is, is somebody um, quoting a passage from White Rage in, in relationship to voter suppression, what's going on now. Um, yeah. But uh, I also wanted to say before we get started, just a little more housekeeping. Um, just uh, if you want to come in, just uh, raise your hand and um, you can join in the conversation. And you know, if we have some back and forth, that's also totally fine. Um, you can also type in chat, and I'll try to interject it uh, verbally myself for you. And um, with that, let's let's continue, y'all. And um, yeah. <laughs> can I make a suggestion, Amanda? Yeah, sure. We have not, it, at least in my opinion, gotten a lot of great success with the discussion questions. <laughs> you know, we have this we have this guide. Yeah. Uh, and. And uh, you know, I wrote the one for the Lichten book, and so I, I feel like I keep trying to bring it back to the discussion questions. Like, doesn't anybody want to talk about the discussion questions? Uh, but but maybe at least for starters, we could open it up to to anyone who has you know anything they want to say without necessarily feeling like we need to start it off with the discussion questions. Just sort of a current perspectives um, or, or based off the book or not? Well, just what, what, you, uh, what you got out of the book, what you thought was most striking about it, uh, what was surprising about it. Uh, um, I, can, I can start. Um, uh, I guess I can say I, it was a short read. It was only like 160 pages, I think. Um, but uh, uh, what was, I mean, surprising to me, there's a couple of things, but I know one of the, the main things I bookmarked was, um, I remember following like Chris Kobach and all that, um, wanting to create a Nash, that Pence commission to create like where they wanted everybody's voting, everybody's data from every single state and stuff like that. But um, uh, I know that um, one thing that really struck me was on page 88, and uh, it was about um, 
crosscheck and it was about so crosscheck was this um it it's well it was and is this uh 27 state um badly built database voter database that states use to cross check names but it's so badly built that it's been criticized that you know anybody with any database experiences but but basically what it is is like i don't know there's like 500 james browns with or without a middle initial in georgia alone and how many are there in all 27 states sharing this and then so it's going through and flagging all these people as the same person and it's absurd how yeah. badly um badly designed this database is but also there is a more sinister thing about having the same last name and the prevalence of uh, last name or like the last name distribution in specific cultural groups. Um, I just want to read this to y'all real quick. Um, so uh, it's really so cross checks over reliance on a handful of selected data points like first and last name only. I mean, how many other data they don't even use like like social care. They don't even use the social security number, even though they're supposed to, which at least that would be unique. But um, uh, it's a handful of selective data points and it feeds into the second major problem. And this is per Carol Anderson herself. It is a program infected with racial and ethnic bias. And that is because minorities in America tend to have common or shared last names. If your last name is Washington, for example, there's an 89% chance that you're African American. Hernandez, a 94% chance that you're Hispanic. Kim, a 95% chance that you're Asian. Similarly, Garcia, Lee, and Jackson all signal a strong possibility of being a minority in the United States because minorities are overrepresented in 85 of 100 of the most common last names. As a result, when cross-check zeroes in on name matches, whites are underrepresented by 8% on the purge lists while African Americans are overrepresented by 45%, Asian Americans by 31%, and Hispanics by 24%. With crosscheck preservating on similar last names, it has blasted a hole through minority voting rights. So this crosscheck program, again, I want to reiterate, 27 states are using it. It's wild. I mean, you, you if you have ever gone to vote in an election and they're like, oh, you've been purged, it's probably because of cross-check. I can't remember if Louisiana's on that list, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I know obviously Georgia and Kansas are for sure, but this is this is the Secretary of State of Kansas's big thing. And he's just been an incredible just scourge on on voting rights through the through the various processes of purging his disenfranchisement. So let's see here. We have a hand raised. Uh Rel. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say, um, first of all, that's horrifying. I haven't read the book yet, and okay. thank you. I, it, it, you're making such a good case for me to read this book, uh, as horrifyingly depressing as what you just said is. Um, it reminded me of the topic of digital redlining. I don't know if you, everyone here, I imagine, sure. knows what redlining is. Mm -hmm. Digital redlining is sort of what you're describing right now. It's how we use algorithms to oppress people. I'm going to post in the chat really quick a, a, a link about it. I haven't vetted that link particularly heavily, but I just wanted to like put a link about it in there. Um, but it's about how you can use data points or the way digital redlining works is you use data points that are disingenuous. So for example, you might say like, oh, we're making loans to people based on this weird arbitrary data point, their wrist size. It turns out that people, if you just measure around their wrist, you can tell, um, how likely they are to default on a loan. And, and it'll be something insane like that, where you're like, but then you think about it and you're like, oh, it's actually men have bigger wrist size, like a wider wrist and have more money. So they're less likely to default on a loan. You're, you're choosing a disingenuous data point, like uh, as, as in the example you just gave of, all you know people in certain groups are more likely to have the same last name 
And so they're more likely to be targeted and picked on by this software. And um, yeah, it's really insidious. And uh, uh, it, the, it turns out that all of our biases, we build them into the software we build. And then we pretend that our algorithms are neutral. Anyway, that was all I wanted to say. That's super intriguing, actually. And that's an yeah. The, uh, I have the, one comment. I looked up the cross check. Oops. Okay, let me. I so I can wave my hand. I, I looked up cross check, and they say that as of 2019, it's been suspended. You know, a, a number of states right. people complained, and I mean cross party lines um, about the uh, uh, privacy issue. I know that was a big. Uh, bone of contention here in Louisiana about using cross-check. People did not want their per, uh, personal information to be disseminated across the country, so to speak. You know, so, but but I understand that uh, following in the uh, um, American Civil Liberties uh, Union uh, lawsuit that, that it was suspended, you know, and that was in 2019. So I, that's not to say that they won't come up with something else, but but that's the most recent information I've seen on CrossCheck. Yeah. Um, my understanding also is that CrossCheck was, you know, it was really uh, developed by Chris Kovac and in conjunction with the so-called Pence Commission, which is an artifact of the first year of the Trump administration, really when they set out to create this well, I say I would characterize it as a sort of national version of what's happening now in Georgia and Iowa and, and other places on the state level. Uh, but, but, and so, you know, the, the Pence Commission was an attempt to nationalize this notion that voter fraud is widespread and that, you know, something needs to be done about it. And, and the Pence Commission kind of fell apart. Uh, and it, I remember in the first year of the Trump administration, I was like, oh my God, this is terrible that they're going to do this. But, you, you know, then again, another characteristic of the Trump administration was sometimes the nefarious things they were going to do just kind of didn't happen. And I don't know why, you know, whether it was because of internal disagreement or just no, no follow through, but it seems like the state level is, is now really the arena where these things are happening. Uh, and the, you know, the state level is also where, for example, uh, district boundaries are drawn. And so there's a whole chapter in the, in the book about gerrymandering and uh, not only partisan gerrymandering, but data-driven gerrymandering, which is done now with GIS software on a very sophisticated level, where you can run modeling that is going to show you how the state house representation will come out based on different boundaries. Uh, and you know, some states have adopted, uh, you know, a rule that says they have to have a bipartisan or nonpartisan uh, district and committee, but that's very hard to to enforce in, in you know, in a sort of practical level. Um, I just wanted to interject that actually interstate cross check um, had 45 million names by 2012 in the database. Um, oh, so it predates the... Yeah, uh, Kansas, he came up with this in Kansas and it well predates and it led to, I think, right. the merging of um, a couple million names ahead of the 2016 election. Right. Uh, there was another, on 87, it says the cross check as an error rate of more than 99%, which I don't understand how a database can have an error rate of 99%, but anyway. Uh, 
Anyone else just, uh, you know, general uh, comment in the book? And Rel, I saw where you said in the comments that you like the discussion questions, so maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong about ditching the discussion questions. And I mean, the first discussion question is, is a very general one that is pretty much pretty close to what I said, which just says, prior to reading the book, how would you characterize your understanding of contemporary voting rights struggles in the United States? And has the book changed your understanding? If so, how? We're just going around in a circle. <laughs> that's, that's where we are now. You know, we're going back to where we things used to be. And the question is, what? What do we know? What have we learned um, from past experiences? And how do we go about um, helping folks get around the obstacles that are, are being set in place to prevent them from voting? You know, that could be where. Um, um, we have to do some, you know, add some components to our one-stop shops, you know, and and have folks to come in who are experiencing it, um, uh, voting issues, who know they don't have a, a, a birth certificate because they their grandmama was a midwife and 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 et cetera. I mean, all the things that need to happen to to uh, help folks overcome these obstacles. And, 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 and it's interesting that I haven't heard a lot yet. And I say me because um, as an African American, there should be, you know, there should be a, a little bit more, I guess, out there in, the, um, in inner space or whatever, you know, coming our way, feeding us like all of the, right? But I think right now everybody's more focused on um, uh, the pandemic and, and vaccinations and, and overcoming, you know, the hesitancy in the African-American community. And, and, um, uh, and so maybe that's where the focus is. And I'm not saying they aren't doing anything. I'm just saying that right now it may be taking a, a you know, a back seat until they get to uh, a point where they feel more comfortable. I think later this fall, especially once the session starts, that's when people are really gonna, you know, start refocusing on this. Because we all know that redistricting is coming up. And um, once the census numbers are out later on this fall, we know with, what's going to happen with, with, with the uh, redistricting issues. And um, therein we'll decide, you know, what happens and where do we, where can we maximize our political strength? It might be that we have to just focus on national elections, you know? And uh, if that's indeed, you know, a, a way to go, but we just have to see. So that that's my thought. Um, just one note on the upcoming legislative session, uh, and this is also a plug for for our our final session next Saturday, uh, where we're going to be focusing on the issue of felon disenfranchisement uh, in conjunction with the Manza and Rubin's book, Locked Out. Uh, and we're gonna have some representatives from uh, an organization whose acronym is VOTE. And they are currently uh, 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 lobbying in the, in the upcoming session for a new bill, which is going to automatically restore voting rights uh, to over 40,000 former convicted felons. These are, these are people who have served uh, their time and, uh, and who by the letter of the law are 
allowed to vote, but the process is cumbersome and difficult and non-transparent. Uh, and so as also recently happened in North Carolina, this legislation would make that automatic and they wouldn't have to do the petitioning process. Uh, so they'll be coming on to the session uh, a week from today uh, to talk about that and to talk about their work in general and to talk about volunteer uh, uh, and opportunities to support that work. And when we've got a hand. Emily, yeah. Um... Actually, you just answered uh, part of what I wanted to speak on. I wanted to ask a question. Um, is that a local group or a federal, a national group? Um, it's a Louisiana group. Oh, that's awesome. Um, Cause yeah. I was gonna ask, um, I was gonna ask, you know, in lieu of me actually moving completely back to Georgia and, and working with Stacey Abrams or other organizers groups, if there were local voting rights groups that we could try to send $5 to when we got it or volunteer for. So I'm so super, super excited to hear that. And to Ms. Bridget's point, um, I'm not really proud of this, but especially lately, I have gotten a lot of my news or a lot of my hot takes from Twitter, um, and that sort of led me to more investigations. Um, and I've seen a meme recently that's like about the Georgia voting, you know, laws that are happening, where <clears throat> basically they're calling what's happening now in Georgia like Jim Crow 2.0. And I was um, I was really struck by that. I mentioned this to 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 Rel and and um, um, uh, Amanda. This is a book. It's a book of essays, and I just I've been reading like one essay a day when I get an opportunity to by Eula Bliss. It's called Notes from No Man's Land: American Essays, and it's like a per personal experience weaved together with um, weaved together with history. And it's, today's essay that I read is called Landmines, and it was about her experience teach as a teacher in the classroom and seeing the inherent violence that like uh, she as a teacher and other teachers were sort of taught to enact upon students. And um, uh, it was it was really informative and it kind of spoke to you, not, not having read today's book, but sort of the conversations we've been having and the other books that I've been reading. And anyways, I'm gonna wrap this up soon. I just wanted to say also piggybacking on what Miss Bridget said, I would love if it were possible for us to like, have another session on each book in the fall when um, maybe we've had a chance to reflect some more and come back together if that's possible. And I say that as a person who works at the library, so I know it may not be possible, but anyways. Uh, well, I, I also wanted to say something about what Miss Bridget had said um, uh, she, she was like, we keep going round and round. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, um, you know, this, I remember when I was in college, I read about Alexander Hamilton and federalism. The whole idea is to disenfranchise people. That's what our country's founded on. They actually thought that that was correct, that they were, you know, just like not letting the, the uneducated people have an opinion, right? And, and I'm sure this is covered in several of the books that we, you know, <laughs> you know, have been touching upon in this discussion, but this is the system working as it's supposed to, <laughs> like, to, 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 like the disenfranchising people is built into it. And we have to hope that the arc of history bends towards justice, you know, <laughs> we have to keep working for it. I, like hope in the dark, you know, but right. yeah, I just wanted to say that, that's it. Uh, yeah, I wanna jump in on that rel because that touches uh, on uh, a lot of my work and reading in, in grad school and so on, but you're absolutely right. And not just, I mean, Hamilton was, was Hamilton was probably the, the most anti-democratic of the, of the uh, early founders, no question. Uh, but but generally, as a as a class, uh, these people did not believe in democracy as as we would understand it. Um, and a very common interpretation of uh, say the first eighty years of the United States history or so is that the idea of democracy 
did take hold uh, and did become more widespread and did become more generally accepted, but with a, a very big but uh, for, for white people in particular, which was not a distinction made so much at the time of the founding where, you know, in many cases in Northern states, at least free African-Americans could vote. Uh, but in the, in the 1820s and 30s, the so-called Jacksonian period, you had uh, this two-part movement where on the one hand, people were very uh, much moving towards ideas of egalitarianism and one man, one vote, but for, for, for white men. So, there were, so the, for example, the property qualifications where you had to own a certain number of acres or dollars worth of property, those all disappeared. So in a way, okay, great, we're becoming more democratic. But at the same time, those uh, free of African-Americans who could vote, they can't anymore now. And, and this is nothing not to do with slavery. We're talking about free black people in the North. Uh, and so, you know, scholars have used the phrase uh, white man's democracy or, or white republic uh, for the 1820s and 30s period. But, and, and then, uh, the the other big historical uh, point to put on that is then the Fourteenth Amendment, because the Fourteenth Amendment is a part of our Constitution, and along with the Thirteenth and Fifteenth, the so-called Reconstruction Amendments, uh, and it's it's often argued that the the Fourteenth and really all those all three of the Reconstruction Amendments did institutionalize uh, democracy and the idea of equal protection and citizenship for all in a way that the 1788 constitution uh, did not. And uh, I wonder if, uh, if, if anyone else has anything on this, on, you know, the idea of what's happening now as being uh, sort of a, a continuation or a, a sort of second wave of Jim Crow laws of, uh, you know, disenfranchisement, is it, is, it, is it the same as the first Jim Crow period? Is it different in some way? Uh, your thoughts on that? I actually um, uh, wanted to, I, I, I think about that, but also um, I wanted to uh, point to actually discussion question four, which is kind of the same, or uh, this is uh, not, this is parallel, but yeah. is it easier to ignore voter suppression today because it is not accompanied by the physical violence that it was accompanied by in the past? Could a nonviolent resistance campaign like those seen during the civil rights movement help address issues of vote suppression? Yeah. And does anybody have any, you know, like, is, is that the difference between then and now? Is that there's not as much open violence, physical violence? Although I would argue that <laughs> there was some pretty bad optics this past week um, in terms of, you know, physical interactions related to voting rights. Sure. There's also a part of that question which goes, how should the media cover current voting rights issues? And I'd, I'd love to hear what people think of the media coverage, how, how they feel these issues are being represented. Um, what media do you consume when you get your news? I have, a, I have a comment. Yeah. We're in an interesting place right now in the sense that when I said, you know, circle, full circle, basically, we have voter suppression on one hand, coupled with overt white supremacy on the other. 
and 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 it and it's kind of like a a shock to your system, you know. Um, what is the end result? And that's why I write, say what I do. What is the end result? You know, is it to um, ultimately strip minorities of um, of all of their rights? You know, and and reading this book, and, and I, I have I have it marked where uh, I'm at one sixty four. Um, you know, people felt, you know, when they couldn't vote, that's, that was, that was, that's the way they felt. They said, well, I'm, I'm no longer a, a citizen. You know, when you took, take away my right, a disabled gentleman or, you know, a, a veteran, when you take away my right to vote after I fought for this country or, or I can't, you know, because I can't drive and get a, a legal uh, driver's license because of my disability, you know, then you stripping me of my citizenship. You know, is what is the ultimate, what's the end result? Because I'm gonna tell you there, you know, when people say, oh, there's Antifa out there and there's, there are a lot of people who have, like I said, it, it's shocking to your system. You know, it's like, what is what do you what do you hope to gain by this? Do you you know do you want to retake the country in such a way that you relegate minorities again to subservient uh, status? And, and and if that is the case, then let me tell you, it's gonna be a hard fought civil war <laughs> because a lot of folks say. They ain't going back to the plantation. And that's the only way I can I can voice it to you. So, you know, I, I think that people are just really having come having a reckoning, an internal reckoning, you know, about how this is all sitting with them. You know, and 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 for uh, uh for the you know the supremacists, oh, well, this is their country. That's the way they feel. They feel, you know, without without remembering or trying to forget how they got this country, you know, what peoples they actually murdered to to take it over, you know, and in a lot of cases, you know, um, the uh, the you know they ruined and and destroyed. African American successful African American communities by you know murder and and took their you know those folks lands and property. What do what do they want? To, what are they? What's the end game here? That's what I want to know. What is the end game? You know what is the end game? So that's why I'm gonna leave y'all. Well, I, I feel like the end game is to extract as much profit out of each individual as possible. I mean, okay, there's a whole variety of people with a whole variety of different motivations, but the people that get to make decisions that affect others are trying to extract the maximum amount of profit out of people. And if they can do that, by telling them that they live in a de democratic society that isn't actually democratic, where you basically have a gun to your head every day to go so that you have to go into work so you can feed yourself, like that keeps you uh, so busy uh, just feeding yourself that you don't have time to be like, wow, I really don't have any rights in this society. And I think that the Goal. I I read this book recently called "They Thought That They They Thought They Were Free," and to make a long story short, a, a guy goes to a journalist goes to Germany after the war there and interviews uh, ten people. Uh, they're all Nazis, little Nazis, like the people that are like. 
the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, Nazis, not the Goebbels. Anyway, the first half of the book is how they tell themselves that they're okay with doing Nazism. And it's an explanation of that. The second half of the book is like, guess what, Americans? You're doing that to Black people and Native Americans right now. And that book was written 60, 70 years ago. Anyway, it's how you tell yourself, how do, you, how do we tell ourselves that it's okay that all of the food that we eat is picked by migrant semi-slave labor? How do we tell ourselves we're okay with the fact that uh, we get cheap goods from China because we're in a foreign war with whomever <laughs> like, or whatever, whatever it is. Like, I don't know. We think we're free. That's all. So if I may jump in real quick. So the end goal, Raul, um, it, it sounds like is to give us enough freedom that that we that we keep being productive and it's that sounds familiar um like we're coming back around again um and um it's really like i don't want to i know we're here for another book so i don't want to actually read from this book but it just that essay that i told you guys about called landmines there's like a, a there's a section that was just really relevant to that in talking about teaching and education like our modern education system and how our education system, you know, sort of came out of that reconstruction era, sort of, um, specifically, she, she talks about how it was like, one of the first public schools was built on a former plantation. And like the the handbooks from the period include like vocabulary words like and this really struck hard with me, kneel, scrub, you know, like, it, they were like teaching, they were teaching young black children um, who had previously been slaves or their parents had just been slaves, how they wanted them to be as, as you know, emancipated citizens of this country, not citizens, you know, not citizens, but emancipated people who lived here, you know, because I, I don't think that they agreed um, to, you know, I don't know that they've ever agreed to allow them citizenship, you know, and even though it's not the same people alive today as was alive then, we're still somehow enacting the same story. And I really, I'm really, really focusing on this reconstruction era, I think. Um, and I really try, I really value this conversation in these books because it seems like we really have to look at that period of time um, in order to try to understand where we're at now. And I, I wasn't taught it and now I'm teaching myself it and with all of y'all's help and other people's help. Do you wanna drop a, a link to the book in chat? Um, possibly the library, the library um, request page? That's, uh, uh, they thought they were free by Milton Miller. Is, is, uh, do you know the year on there, Joe? It's like the 1950s. I think it, okay. it, the, the total- So it's like a Cold War era. Yeah, it's a cold, he yeah. goes there in 1950, I think, or 19, it's like, I, the, there's like a subtitle of it that's like 1933 to 1950. It's like- sure um and uh yeah we it looks like we don't have it in print at the library i'm sure i've tried to acquire it before uh but we do have it uh through audio and ebook and then through hoopla as well as audio i messed up what we have it i, me I messed up but you can search the catalog and and see that uh it's available i'll try to yeah. get it in print i will also oh uh Amanda dropped a, a link to, or Emily Stat uh, dropped a link to the requested. Um, but 
I'll try to, I'll, I'll, I don't know why we don't have it since I'm obsessed with this book and I think about it all the time. Sure. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, Cold War liberalism is a big interest of mine. And so it sounds like that might be where that I am in that regard. I will uh, raise my hand. I, I'd like yeah. to read a quote to you. Um, this is Lyndon Baines Johnson. Great. And this will go back to Rell's book. He says, if you can convince the lowest white man that he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him somebody to look down on and he'll even empty his pockets for you. We are, you know, African Americans, minorities are not the only ones who are facing voter suppression. And so that's why I asked you about the end game. I mean, I, I speak from one from one you know side of this, but this is a class thing. And that's why, you know, when somebody speaks out about how much they love the the uneducated, you know, or the least educated, you know, they're referring to people like um and I keep this on my you know on my phone. Um like you know the, the people that Lyndon Baines Johnson talked about. Right. You know, this is the as they said, this was the uh, overseer and the uh uh, uh sharecropper class. Uh, of the uh, before the Civil War and during the Civil War, you know that sure. that's who these people are. I'm referring to, you know, and um, and, um, and and the only thing <clears throat> that they have to to hold them up and and give them some form of status is their whiteness. But with the you know voter suppression then you take away a lot of, you know, of some of their rights as well, not just from minorities. And, and, and I wonder if, I wonder if they see it. I, I, I don't know. I wonder if they see it. Uh, Bridget, I want to share with you that sometimes I, I drink back and forth from New Orleans. Hand, Sarah, you're next. Sorry. Yes, I saw your hand, Sarah. I just real I just quick. Accidentally lowered it and I didn't mean to. Um, I, I drive back and forth between New Orleans and New York a fair bit. And I always take the upcountry route where I'm mostly on Route 81 and I'm going through Appalachia. And historically, you know, those were areas where mostly uh, poor white people lived going way, way back you know, East Tennessee, West Virginia, uh, there wasn't a lot of plantation slavery in those regions because the, the, the ground was not friend, the ground was not good, it was not friendly to growing cotton. Uh, and those, uh, you know, very common understanding among historians is that those poor white people were essentially given, tossed a bone of racial, superiority in exchange for basically having nothing. And it, I think it's no coincidence that those areas are, I mean, you drive through through uh, East Tennessee or, and you see more Trump signs per capita there than anywhere else, <laughs> or, or even central Pennsylvania, anywhere along that, that Appalachian Ridge, it's really quite remarkable. Anyway, Sarah, you had your hand up uh, for a while. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> a couple of things that Rel and Bridget said, and I hate, like Emily said, I hate to take it away from the book that we're talking about, but another book um, that I've heard discussed a lot is called Cast um, by Isabel Wilkerson. And the origins are discontent is the subtitle. But it talks a lot about the idea that, you know, and I think a term that gets used a lot, especially by liberals, is we 
um, we wonder why, or liberals wonder sometimes why people would quote unquote vote against their interests. And sometimes like the, the idea of having a group below you is enough of an interest yeah. to motivate you to vote against things that we think would be antithetical to your day-to-day -day happiness. Um, and I think it goes to what Bridget said, which is that, you know, you can, if there is a group and other, and you can see yourself above them, that can sometimes be sufficient to motivate you to support certain ideas. And this is obviously a huge discussion about, you know, the voting laws that are happening or the that are trying to be passed and in some cases are being passed right now and Jim Crow, the original Jim Crow era, it's so hard to unpack, but I think a difference now is that I think as opposed to maybe, you know, the idea that we were talking about of physical violence and those um, images motivating people and really drawing things to the forefront, I think the advantage now to the discussion that we're having is there's just so much more information and everybody can, well, not everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, but it's a lot easier to access um, what is actually happening as opposed to, you know, just getting all of your news from the front page of the newspaper that happens to be printed in your town and how the media is handling everything that, how the media handles everything, I think is a topic, a, a big thing to unpack, but I think the benefit that we have now, not just in this discussion, but in a lot of them is how available act information is to people if they just want to go find it. But of course, there's also false information available to them. And if they want to go find that, they can- Very also, true. You can get a lot of reinforcement for your false beliefs if you if that's what you're in the market for, right? That's so a good point. Yeah, I was actually going to say, I, I believe I said in the first uh, one of these three sessions, uh, we were discussing a similar idea to that. And um, I was talking about how on the right, there's a movement now that of people saying, do the research, do the research. You can come up with research that validates any point you want. Like, yes, yeah. there's more information, but also if you look at um, I, I saw this take in from Penn, the First Amendment Rights Advocacy Organization. One of their talking points is basically like, the problem is that it's not, the, the, the problem isn't that we're not giving the microphone to the right people. It's that the people who have that microphone are drowned out by the deluge of other information. And I also wanted to say, I forgot, I wanted to say this earlier, but I forgot at some point, but um, the, uh, I, I have been hate reading the New York Times every single day for the last 20 years. The, the, uh, the just the email, I mean, I dig into the article sometimes too, but uh, I guess it's only 18 years or something, but anyway, um, and the way that they cover, okay, the problem with the New York Times is they ha are doing some of the absolute best reporting in the world right next to complete trash, just absolute manufactured consent trash. <laughs> um, and the problem is, you know, <laughs> which one is which? <laughs> um, and so, I mean, the, the, the perspective on the issues and what's not said and what, what is left out of the conversation, which perspective, whose voices are left out of, of the conversation. Um, it's just so much. I, I don't know. That, that was all I wanted to add. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay, just to respond to Rel real quickly. I think that leads to a question of or for me at least, at least to the question of, do we want to shut down the bad voices or the voices of misinformation, or do we want to foster a community where people are able to look at that and discard it as false, right? And I think that the people who are suppressing votes, 
I guess, don't really care about either, but they certainly don't want to lead to a more, they don't want their actions to lead to a more educated class where people can make better decisions. Um, and I think that, you know, first, and now we're like completely off voting rights and onto the first amendment, but I think that is a very touchy topic um, for me. Obviously I don't like fake news, but I also am leery of attempting to decide what is and isn't fake news. And to me, a better tact is to try and, you know, hope for a society and do whatever we can individually to foster a society where people are able to make better decisions. But I think that there are a lot of people who, in order to maintain their own power as a group or individually, don't want that to happen and don't want people to be able to make those better decisions and then to act on them in a way that would benefit them individually to the expense of the people who are in power. I think I honestly, uh, or I'm sorry to interject, um, but just to continue on the tangent of, or well, I, not not to continue, but I wanted to jump to um, the idea of the people of power, which I know we've already kind of um, discussed. Like, but I wanted to refer to end game and what's their goal, and um, yeah, to disenfranchise class, or you know, to in, to to give to give um, you know the lowest white man the ab ability to look down on the highest black man. Um, all of that is to the end of, I think, ultimately um, disenfranchising everybody, but it's just easier to do it to minorities at this point. They're going after the people who are already somewhat disenfranchised. And I do think the end game is, is authoritarianism for the elite political class so they can continue to reselect themselves into power, which uh, you know, uh, Miss Anderson like addresses in this book the point of gerrymandering to just like um, skew vote results such that you reselect yourselves to be overrepresented in the halls of power so you can continue to elect yourselves back into the hall of power. Um, you know, it's it's an it's an endless feedback loop. But um, I, I do think there is an ultimate goal, literally, of 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 a small authoritarian government that is the goal and and it is with the idea of all people in the country to bring it back to the idea of uh, people as productive resources um to have literally all of the rest of us just be um batteries and productive workers but that's uh i'm really getting out here with that i realize it sounds ridiculous but i i, I do feel like the end goal is um concentrating power in the hands of very few people I don't find your comment ridiculous, Amanda. Yeah, neither do I, but partially because it, you know, piggybacks off of my comments. So <laughs> I oh. guess my, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, I guess one of the points I was passively making was we're sort of all disenfranchised by this supposed democracy that we enjoy. There are just people who are much more disenfranchised by the same system. Um, none of us, uh, yeah, that's all. Well, I was just gonna say that I, before, uh, you know, the session this morning when Amanda and I got in on to do our sound check, I was I told her that I had watched the YouTube of the session from the first week. And what I got out of that was that I needed to talk a lot less. So I'm trying to not <laughs> to not lost the fool and just listen to what everybody has to say. Uh, but I there is one little bit of a teacherly question that I'd like to toss out there, which is simply, why is this all happening? Why is it happening now in particular? And by now, I guess I would mean since roughly since the 2016 election cycle uh, to the present. Why now? What, and, and I'm not asking that as an open-ended question. I have a very definite notion of why, <laughs> but I, I don't want to just 
just to make it. Don't, don't overthink it. You were, I'll, I'll speak. Yeah. It's happening now because the person they had hoped to uh, uh, st still be president serving their second term lost the election. And um, and the and the way they they lost the election was by an overwhelming eighty million votes as opposed to seventy four well seventy three point something million votes. Right. And I mean, the idea that all of these folks would come out and actually vote their hearts. You know, and and what's in their best interest? Has forced the suppressors to say, okay, we, we have got to stop this. And I mean, right. and, and they have someone out there who is, you know, the kingmaker, so to speak, right. who is um, pushing it and pushing them to to go, you know, go the extra mile so that Amanda's end game will be realized maybe even faster than than um, they thought possible. You know, it used to be sneaky. Now it's like out there in the open. I mean, how many you know how many times are you going to hear about uh, um, an attorney going before the Supreme Court and saying, "Well, the only way we go win is if we cheat." That's what Arizona said. We have to cheat, you know. So, I believe I believe Michigan said that too. But um, Emily, Emily, if you had your hand raised, well, I'm always I'm always happy to stand back if someone who hasn't spoken as much. But it's like I both want to follow Miss Bridget and never want to follow you because you raise such good points that I want to be in conversation with. But I'm also like, man, I can't follow that. Um, I would say, I feel like that's a hundred percent correct, but also the first, his first election, I think is why now as well, because I think for those of us who were, um, not hustling as hard, who had some privilege, who didn't, who were hustling hard enough to not see some stuff because we were busy and, and hadn't been forced to see, I think the 2016 election was a wake up call to a lot of us that we had let things happen, um, in the, in the background without our, our consent or our knowledge or our, or even really deep consideration because we were, we were hustling or it didn't affect us or it didn't feel like it affected us, you know, all variety of, of reasons, you know, and I think, I, I think for a lot of us, including me, like the 2016 election was um, a tragedy first that I had to grieve. And I went into like deep grief for a couple of years and then, and then was like, I, I got to be part of the solution, you know, so I think that that's why now is I think that there's a lot of a groundswell of people who previously for whatever reason uh, didn't believe that they were affected or didn't think they had the time or that it wasn't their place or they didn't, you know, they didn't have a place in, in, in the fight because it wasn't their fight, you know, or, or whatever the reasons I think a lot of a lot of us realized that we had to be part of the fight one way or another, because even in our absence and our silence, we were, we were participating, contributing to this, to the problem. I just want to, I want to uh, press you guys just a little bit harder on this, because I really agree. First of all, I agree with Bridget that the 2020 election is, was hugely important. And I would argue even that the, the capital insurrection, so-called on January 6th, was hugely important in creating our, our new reality. And I also agree with Emily that the 2016 election uh, did change a lot. But when I asked the question, I was thinking of something else. And I was thinking of what uh, Carol Anderson says on the second to last page of the book. She says, a major legal and political paradigm shift has taken place. Since what? What happened in, now I'll really give it away, 2013 that changed everything? Yeah, the, the, the gutting of the Voting Rights Act. The Supreme Court decision 
shall be the holder. Uh, so uh, you guys know what that was, what that really changed? Is that uh, states don't have to ask the Supreme Court for permission to change their rules again. They can basically like go, justice, um, the decision basically said, we can trust these states not to seek review of their voting laws anymore because they've proven that you know they can do it right. And I forget who said this and I'm probably butchering the quote, but it's like saying, um, I'm not getting wet anymore so I don't need this umbrella, right? Like you don't that know was, uh, if- R Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Okay, yeah. yeah. So you don't, was that from the dissent? That's embarrassing. I didn't yes, know where it, it came from. from the um, <laughs> but yeah, it's like, you know, we can trust them to not to police themselves because under our supervision, they've been doing fine, which is obviously right. a ridiculous sentiment. So, yeah, and that's what John Roberts said in the majority opinion is that the Voting Rights Act was made for a different era, and those realities no longer apply. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, that's like throwing away your umbrella in a storm because you're not getting wet. <laughs> and so all of these laws, uh, or the, I, I should say, not all of them, but at least the ones in the, the Southern states could not happen. The Georgia law that just passed could not happen before the Shelby decision. Uh, under the Voting Rights Act, Georgia had to seek the approval of the Justice Department in order to ch change its voting laws. And that was because uh, Congress in 1965 recognized the long history of voter suppression, particularly of Black voters in the South. They rec you know, Congress recognized that as a reality and did something about it. And the, the thing that they did about it worked. It was still messy. You know, there still had to be litigation. There were, it wasn't, you know, totally cut and dry, but it worked in a very real way until 2013. And, it, and as soon as 2013 and Shelby happened, the, the states were ready. The states were like, okay, great, let's go to town. Uh, so I guess my point is a law or a Supreme Court decision can make a profound difference. <laughs> and it's kind of not how we like to believe the world works, right? We like to believe that there are there are sort of massive gradual movements or there's people power or that the arc of the universe bends towards justice. But no, all it takes is really one Supreme Court decision to happen and you can throw away that arc <laughs> and bend towards justice. Yeah, Emily. Sorry, I keep bringing up Georgia, y'all. Um, it's personal for me, though, and it's it's it's. it's I hope it's, I hope it's. I think it's relevant because it's happening right now. But um, I was thinking about this in the background during our whole conversation. But again, just now, in that you know, um, I watched Representative Cannon arrested or detained. I mean, they didn't read her Miranda rights, so she was not arrested but she was detained and put in a cop car by two large policemen, large white policemen for, right. and it made me think of what I've, you know, in my fairly recent adult past learned about how many senators there were of, you know, of African descent during, you know, the, the post, the reconstruction era. And then all of a sudden yeah. there was none and we erased that history. And I'm, this is a woman who's a lawmaker. She has every right to, to question the governor, to, to slow down the process, to, you know, and it's just like, we're all watching this happen and we're, 
they're they're rewriting the rules of the game while we're playing it and saying well now you have to abide by these rules we just invented and we're like but wait but wait justice the rules you've been allowed to abide by and it just terrified me enraged me um and and it, it made me think again about how what would have wouldn't I don't think this would have been possible when Stacey Abrams was running for governor against who was at the the governor now who was the Secretary of State. It seems to me that if you are running for a position, you should not be running the election. That he should have had to step he should have had to step down as the Secretary of State in order to run for governor. To me, that does not seem just. And, and I don't know if that would have been, I don't know enough of the law, I don't know enough of the precedent to know if that would have happened if not for that 2013 decision. I'm, you know, I'm only just now learning, but like those two things have been in my mind and there's a lot more coming out of Georgia and I know that they're, they're elsewhere in the country right now. But yeah, you guys have been making me think about those things. And so I just wanted to, to bring that up. Uh, are you talking, Amanda? You seem to be muted. Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, that that. Um, so, uh, what Emily was just saying, um, the whole like that, that was flabbergasting to me that the Secretary of State was supervising the ele his an election he was running in for governor, and then to see what happened this past year with Stacey Abrams and the voting turnout um, indicates to me that. I'm 98% sure she probably did, should have, would have, and probably did win that election for governor, like given what happened. But um, it brought me to, she yeah. did that despite, she like she um, turned Georgia in this past election, despite all the obstacle courses that had already been thrown up before they passed this latest bill and and that reminded me of um like uh let's see here it was um it was uh on page 126 127 uh they start talking about everything that's popped up since 2013 becomes an extended obstacle course for um specifically minorities to vote in the southern states like they close courthouses is the only place to register. They close DMVs. They make it so, and then and this is with surgical precision. There were people in a room. I mean, and this is actually documented because somebody released somebody's papers, a Republican advisor, you know, voting advisor's papers a couple of years ago. If anybody can have to look up the link. But um, uh, like um, first is Merrill had. This is this is um, there was. Still, like it appeared that they disenfranchised 844,000 uh, black people in Alabama. This is what Alabama set up to to impede um, black people voting. Essentially, uh, let's see here. You had to drive like 20 miles away. They closed most DMVs, so to get a get a license in order to vote in the first place, you had to you know travel like hours away um and then like they claimed that well you could just go register at the local courthouse you know not acknowledging that you know people had warrants out for their arrest for like non-payment of debts you know there's also like the debt to prison pipeline and how that discourages and that disproportionately affects minorities and the poor and how that prevents them from going to government places because they might be arrested the idea of putting polling places in sheriff's offices all of that the additional obstacle course. But then um, to hear it from, I believe it was, uh, John Merrill was Alabama's Secretary of State. He said, if you're too sorry or lazy to get up off your rear to go register to vote or to register electronically and then to go vote, then you don't deserve that privilege. Just completely ignoring that 18 other steps and obstacles had been put up for people to go through to vote. It became an obstacle course that only affected black people. And that that's the response. And he said, 
he twisted not only the state constructed barriers into personal failings, but also the 15th Amendment into a privilege and not a right. As long as I'm Secretary of State of Alabama, he boasted, you're going to have to show some initiative to become a registered voter in this state. It's, it's just, it's, it, and then this is what's going on in every Southern state now. And Georgia, right now, right, right now. Yeah, I, uh, and Sarah posted in the chat the privilege versus right point was the first thing that came to mind, which I think is a good way to encapsulate it. So. Oh, bro. Yeah. I did not know about that. And I'm really that honestly one of my favorite things of coming out of this <laughs> is learning about that 2013 voting rights bill. Thank you. Um, I was reading uh, a couple months ago. I read How to Be an Anti Racist. I think I mentioned that at some point. But anyway, in that book, there's a lot of great parts in that book. But one of them was about how much voter suppression went on in the 2000 election of George W. Bush in Florida. Florida, yeah. The is in there as well, right? Yeah. yeah. She she does uh, she does cover that uh, not in a whole lot of depth, but she does uh, devote a couple pages to it in that chapter about the history. So I was going to ask if voter suppression, if extreme voter suppression was going on like that in the year two thousand, which is how we got that particular war criminal to be our president. Uh, if that was what was going on in 2000, how consequential, first of all, how did it even get passed that states could handle their own, <laughs> yeah. how much did that law affect things? And if it was already going on before, can, can someone speak to that? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good point. Uh, and if I understand correctly, what you're saying is what what were the what provision, what protections was the Voting Rights Act giving Floridians in, in 2000? Uh, 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 Florida in 2000 was a really uh, special case because it was uh, it was so close, and a lot of the uh, a lot of you know what turned out to be the outcome hinged on whose votes could be counted and what the what happened in the count itself. So they would get these uh, these uh, voting machines that you could fairly clearly discern the intention of the voter, but in a punch card, maybe the circle wasn't entirely punched through <laughs> or something. <laughs> so those are the infamous hang chats. So it was about the procedures to be taken in the count and uh, not about the rules of the election going into the election. And, and no one had ever dealt with a, a state that was you know, within 500 votes. So it was completely wide open in, those, in that period of, of doing the recount, what the rules for the recount would be and who whose votes would be counted in the recount. And then, of course, the Florida Secretary of State, who was Jeb Bush's you know, second in command, just decided to stop the recount. And then the Supreme Court, by a 5-4 decision, confirmed the stopping of the recount. So the Voting Rights Act could only affect a state's laws about the election. But it wouldn't necessarily it wouldn't speak to the situation that arose in Florida in 2000 about the procedures for the recount. That was just a. Well, wasn't there like a? I got the impression from this book. It's been a couple months since I read the book, but I got the impression that the voter suppression happened also before the election. Like they passed a law right before the election that was like uh, something about felons and their voting rights or something like that. I don't remember the whole thing, but I thought it was like an active voter suppression campaign yes. that took place. Well, for, uh, felony disenfranchisement was a big thing in, in Florida, and it is a big thing in many states, but particularly in Florida. 
Uh, and that is also its own kind of special case. And, I, and if, I think we should table that for next week because that is our whole focus uh, for next week. Was it the state Supreme Court that stopped the voting or was it the, the federal Supreme Court? Well, no, the state, I mean, in my recollection, Amanda, in, in the state Supreme Court mandated the recount. And oh, then sure. Catherine Harris shut down the recount just by sort of order. So I, and I, lots of people said, no, that ain't legit. But then the Supreme, the United States Supreme Court confirmed the shutting down. That's my So I know this is like, um, I, I mean, I don't really have like a whole lot of experience in law, but I know there's like some sort of legal reason about this. And I was hoping maybe one of y'all might know, but like, like um, in uh, the gerrymandering case, you know, Scalia and the conservative court said that like, this was not, this wasn't the business of the courts. Like this wasn't the business of the Supreme Court to like um, step in on gerrymandering. But then it right. was the business of the Supreme Court to step in on vote counting. Like, I'm so, I guess I'm a little, I know, I guess it's probably two completely different parts of law, but like, yeah. I just, when, I don't understand when the Supreme Court, at least with those members, felt it was appropriate to screw around in the voting process and when it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> They excluded our elect our elected leaders. They and they stepped in, and when it didn't, they didn't. Yeah, I mean the Supreme Court's supreme. So yeah, that a lot of people said this is not a good decision, but they are the we we really don't. And just like with the Shelby v. Holder decision, we don't have a, a, a recourse beyond the Supreme Court other than to change the law moving forward uh, you know through the legislative branch and by the way Sarah's a lawyer and I'm not so she <laughs> <laughs> um, Sarah are you do you have something uh, to help with us uh, trying to figure this out? I've had I, reading Rill's uh, post in the chat. I don't think Sarah is with us. And it, no, I am here. Um, oh, okay. I was just saying, unfortunately, Supreme Court law is not necessarily my area of expertise. <laughs> um, anecdotally, um, I've hesitated to talk about this on the show, but I have a podcast trying to figure out civics uh, with a, another friend of mine, and we bring on and interview friends and most of us are Southerners. And a lot of the people that I've interviewed and talked to about this, um, I mean, coincidentally, a lot of us are on the same age, but not all of us. The 2000 election anecdotally seems to be in a very unscientific study and just some conversation with people over the course of my whole life, so impactful on people's voting sort of futures after that point. Um, like how they viewed their their enfranchisement in this country, depending on who they are and where they were. Um, and I think a lot of people like myself, that was my first selection. And, and I didn't necessarily think, oh, well, I wasn't franchised by, you know, my vote didn't count. I didn't necessarily think that immediately, but I was like, this doesn't quite seem right. You know, like it, kind of seems like the loser is our president you know or like the people the the, the person who the people more people wanted is is not leading us you know and and i think that that forms a lot of people or it has formed a lot of people's um electoralism and 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 comfort and and trust in in, in the process well and just so to say one thing about the supreme court and about this one area of law I do know is that certainly I have been on the side of a judge's decision that I did not agree with. And there are times when you can take it up to be reviewed and there are there is a limit to that, right? And in 
for this for a lot of these cases that we're talking about, it's the United States Supreme Court. And like we said about the different information you can find to support your decision, it is also the case that very intelligent judges, which they are the justices, can find legal precedent to support just about any position that they want to. And so it can be disheartening sometimes. And I think um, the Shelby case is a good example that like you can disagree with what they have said, but they can find legal precedent to, and this is every judge, can find legal precedent to support their ruling against you. And then the recourse is to take it back to the Congress and try and legislate, to elect people to legislate differently. But that's really hard when the whole point of the court's decision was to stop you from being able to vote. Yeah, and so catch 22 there. <laughs> By the way, I looked up uh, uh, a minute ago, I looked up uh, which states were subject to the clearance requirements in the Voting Rights Act. And there are nine states that were subject, and Florida is not one of them. Florida was one of uh, five states that had certain counties subject to free clearance requirements. So there were five Florida counties that were subject to free clearance under the VRA, but not the state as a whole. It would be interesting to check and see what the demographics of those counties look like. I think you could probably guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know anything about the decision process for like how they chose the counties subject to preclearance requirements in, for the Voting Rights Act. I mean, I want to imagine that, that there was a lot of sort of forced trading and negotiation over that back in 1965. I, I was just gonna say, uh, it's a little off topic, but back to Sarah's point um, about how the judges can find precedent anywhere, you know, uh, or for, excuse me, not anywhere, but not anywhere, but for anything that they're trying to support. And it made me it, it made me think about a uh, response to something you had said earlier um, also about you know how we want to teach people critical thinking we want to teach people to be able to assess what information is bad uh, there you know and I 100% agree with you with that point that we do need to teach critical thinking I guess my point was you know, and I do love this phrase, I've said it before, but necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, you know, it's, it's necessary to teach that, that critical reasoning, but you, as we were saying before, you can find pe people, you can find research to support any point you want. You can, and, and you can use any ideology you want to justify any behavior. You can use communism to do authoritarianism. You just say you're doing communism and then people are like, oh, I guess they're doing communism <laughs> when actually you're doing authoritarianism. You can call things whatever you want. <laughs> um, that was all. I was gonna speak to that too about the judges and their um intelligence because they intelligent people but um there was at some point i can't find it exactly but there was some point i don't it was either in possibly the wisconsin or another case i think in in the rigging the rules chapter where um you know uh gorsuch uh like they were coming come up with a standard who was engaging in voter suppression and, or, or you know, who was engaging in um, suppressive gerrymandering. And the standard that, uh, that they presented, uh, the, um, the, the ACLU, well, the standard they presented, it didn't seem that complicated to me. It seemed fairly, it was like a, it was like categories. And it's like, if then, if then, if then, and if it meets like three or four of these like things are happening, then yes, this gerrymandering is suppressive and unconstitutional. But then Gorsuch, you know, they, like the, the very intelligent justices came back with like what I, I 
you know, and I'm, I'm sure Carol Anderson picked these uh, quotes, you know, specifically to make me angry, but, um, and, and readers angry, but um, Gorsuch said, he mocked the standard as being no way of this and a touch of that, a pinch of this, a pinch of that, as if it were his steak rub, not a real bacteria. Like, so that's a intentionally myopic and to me playing dumb um, opinion work by one of allegedly the smartest, well, you know, one of the, I guess one of the smartest or well, the most cunning guys in the country. Um, and then Roberts, he derided the efficiency gap, which is what it was one of the criteria as gobbledygook and a bunch of baloney. You know, whereas we have the other justices explaining it pretty clearly, I found it pretty clear to understand, but it's just, it's, we essentially have like two of the Supreme Court justices as allegedly the supreme rule and the smartest people in the country playing dumb intentionally to um, a political agenda. That's what I saw, anyway. I'm just smiling at the notion that they are the smartest people in the country. <laughs> Could I ask a question of the group? Sure. Um, so um, do we have any ideas about like what what people can do or is anyone does anyone have any intentions about like what they I think I'm actually like I think I'm actually copying uh, Miss Bridget's question from the email thread that we had. Um, I just realized um, and, and you asked it so well, but I, and I really appreciate it, it was like um, I, for one, am trying to be focused on on, on identifying because, you know, it has been really overwhelming, like uh, the number of things that are falling apart simultaneously. And maybe that's always been true, but like it just feels like a lot. And it's like, where do I put my attention? How do I do the most good in this moment with the energy that I have, the privilege that I have, that kind of thing. And so like, Rel, I think you were 100% correct with what you were saying earlier about like doing communism and calling it authoritarian, I mean, or doing authoritarian and calling it communism I think that was very very accurate but like what do we do does anyone have any ideas well just a very easy response to that and thanks for that Emily uh, uh, I would we check out the links in that list of uh, links if you're looking for organizations to um, to be involved with, to volunteer for, to donate to, uh, you know, uh, go through the list of that links. I certainly plan to do that myself. I mean, there, there are about half of them that I know and about half of them that I have never heard of, but I will uh, read up on them. And also next week, uh, when we have the people coming to vote, you know, they're going to speak to it. Uh, volunteer opportunities with uh, their organization uh, in here in Louisiana, uh, which deals with felony disenfranchisement, but also with issues of mass incarceration in general, uh, which is a related but broader topic. Um, and I would also say uh, this is different depending on where you live, but actually getting involved in local party politics. Uh, is, is, in my opinion, easier than many people imagine who have never done it. And I speak from the experience of having done that in upstate New York uh, in a congressional district that swung from a conservative Republican to actually Kristen Gillibrand in the midterms of 2006. And that was a very rewarding experience to be involved in. Uh, you know, every locality is going to have a different, you know, sort of characteristic and dynamic of its of its local party organization. But I would never uh, rule that out. Uh, and uh, you know, with that, I would also throw it open to anyone else who wants to suggest ways to get involved. Uh, I, think I was. Oh, go ahead. 
I just, I was going to say that I think everybody here is already taking a step in the right direction. You know, just being involved in a conversation, you know, is, is something, you know, to start off with. I agree with that, Sarah. And we talked last week about how this is, this is a lot more somehow substantial and real than, than social media. Um, although, you know, I, I spend my time on, on social media, <laughs> like the majority of people that I know, but, but I, I, think, I think it's, well, it obviously has its, its limitations and so just leave it at that. <laughs> and I also like to suggest um, maybe together, Louisiana, um, where you interact with uh, um, uh, church groups that are involved in uh, social justice type issues. And, and that way you, uh, you learn by doing, because they, um, they, you know, when you, they bring you in and they teach and so that's one of the good things. And then you can maybe find a niche where you feel most comfortable. You know, um, it could be that, you know, maybe you don't want to uh, interact directly. And you may be, but you might be one of their best phone campuses. You know, so you have some options there. Um, and, and that's what I like about that organization. Uh, you know, if you want to do grassroots and, you know, they, they send you out as part of a team, no one goes solo and um, for protection. <laughs> but, um, but I think, you know, that that might be a, a, a good place to start. For you. I'll give you another run for office, <laughs> you know, uh, and and it, or if you, if you don't feel that you have what it takes to, to win office, identify one of your friends who would be great at that and, you know, support them, be their campaign manager. Uh, you know, running for office isn't just, it's not something that's for other people somewhere else. <laughs> it's for all of us, right? And I you support gave her the for office. Yes, I, I would too. <laughs> And you gave Emily and Sarah and um, Braille the, the best advice to go out there and, and get active in local campaigns. That's how you learn, you know, so find a candidate you want to support and then, you know, go walk the streets, you know, go stuff the envelopes, go do the phone canvassing, go find out how you build you know, a fundraising team and, and what's all, you know, what all has to happen to, to, uh, um, to actually be a, you know, to run a campaign. Yeah. You know. I just wanted to add, I haven't thought about this in many years, but uh, I was put pretty politically involved when I was younger. And uh, I spent the summer registering people to vote for the 2004 election. I spent that summer before that election registering people to vote all summer, talked to so many people. And after that election, I stayed out of politics for the whole rest of college. I was like, oh, so it's all rigged. There's nothing you can do. And, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's a crapshoot, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> um, and obviously I got back into, into politics since then. I, I you know, <laughs> it was just that I'd spent all my whole summer being like, well, we can't deal with this asshole again. Like, <laughs> can't, can't have that. <laughs> Surely there's something I can do. <laughs> Well, I, I want you to know that I spent uh, most of the summer of 2004 going door to door in rural upstate New York with Howard Dean. Ah, Howard Dean! I remember. I remember. And, and then he, you know, just got crushed and it was Carrie and we're like, okay, I still support Carrie, but it wasn't just, and, you know. And then 
Carrie got thrown under the bus for the swift boat thing when yeah, he was yeah. in the war and not <laughs> and uh, it, next to the draft dodger they made yeah. him look like the coward it was just like that's the media yeah. that's you know i hate the new york times so you know um anyway just yes but we should get involved but uh i'm glad i'm not as idealistic now as i was then <laughs> well yeah but I mean, you've touched uh, uh, several times today and in the previous sessions on this uh what i consider this dynamic of uh optimism versus resignation <laughs> And I guess maybe uh, by way of closing, you know, I, I have to go in, in a few minutes. I don't know if uh, other people do, but. Um, Did we say we wanted to wrap up around one at least for the, rec um, for the recording? For the recording. I did want uh, to leave for being But I, I want to put in a word uh, for optimism uh, and with a very you know big caveat, which is that optimism in excess can turn into complacency and, and into feeling like, uh, you know, yes, things are going to be better because we have great American values or democracy, or, you, know, you, you know, sort of magical thinking like that. Well, that. That's not what I'm advocating for, but optimism is also, it's kind of a moral stance that you have to retain some hope that, uh, that it, that you can make a difference or it's just like you know you the the downside is just complete apathy and i'll just check out of this the system and the, then the more people do that and it becomes self-fulfilling because then everybody is checked out and so uh, one thing that really inspired me was the book we read last week uh, vanguard and I, I was just looking at my notes from that and uh you know these uh these black women from like the 19th century that she writes about people like sarah max douglas susan paul hester lane mary ann chad uh they did not have the vote they were subject to all kinds of indignities and yet they worked so hard to organize uh for a better future, it, you know, uh, if, if they could do it, uh, then I then I think we all can. Uh, and again, with realism and a recognition that you know, there's always going to be frustrations and difficulties because it's life has frustrations and difficulties, and we don't go past some of those. But uh, before yeah. we go, I have, yeah, one, Bridget, yeah. I have one thing to say. I've been looking at the chat and just about to bust. I said, I support Miss Bridget for office. Okay, first thing y'all need to know is, as you can tell based on my conversation, I do not have what it takes to hedge fences. And so, you know, I was told a long time ago that I could not be a politician. So you have to, you have to have a special, you know, you, you have to be a, you know, you have to be a diplomat. You know, <laughs> I'm not a diplomat. Well, Trump, I don't. Trump certainly wasn't. I'm, I'm <laughs> very candid person, you know. So, um, so that's why I say go work a campaign, go find out what it takes, see, you know, how, how you fit into the scheme of things. And I truly pray that one of y'all will run for office. I'll come down to New Orleans and help and bring my crew with me. <laughs> Miss, Miss Bridget, were you, there was like a Together Louisiana check-in after the December 5th election about Amendment 5, and I still remember I don't know if you were there, but there was um, there was a team, a two-person team in a small community in North Louisiana, and it was a man and a woman. 
I believe it was a, a black, oh, sorry, a white, a white man and a, and a black woman who teamed up. They didn't know each other previously. This was through Together Louisiana. And she did the, he did the door knocking and she did the list, like the phone banking. And then they like switched information. So like, she'd be like, I couldn't reach this person, go knock on their door. And he went and knocked on their doors. And they basically covered their entire town with the two of them for Amendment 5. Um, did you hear that story? Were you, were you privy to that information? No, uh, we worked locally in Baton Rouge, you know, to um, on the amendments and and um, and and I'm not a big well, how should I say it? I'm not a big amendment person. I'm a radical, and so you know, I, I like to uh, to hit the streets for for people, for candidates, you know. So uh, and, and for um, uh, um, I. I worked really hard to um, try to stop the breakaway for the, the city of St. George. I thought that was a terrible thing and I still do. And, um, you know, so, I, but, but they do send us out as, that's why I said as teams, you, you know, you, you do not go alone, you know, but give it a try, give, you know, try, try it. Go out there and see where you fit, where you fit. And, and I'll be looking to, you know, I, I have to laugh because I do read the New York Times. <laughs> I subscribe to it as well. So do I. So do I, Bridget. You know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's together Louisiana um, and everything that we just discussed. Um, become a block captain right at the top. Great. <laughs> that was a bad circle. Thanks, Amanda. And that video that you that's in that embedded in there, why Louisiana stays so poor is, is a really impactful video. Oh, I, I'll put it back up. Sorry, I was just doing a quick screen, screen share, but it's um, we can't walk now, but you can if by going to together LA. G. Oh. And I okay, urge everyone so to come back next Saturday and uh, and drag along at least one person come with you. Yeah. Maybe someone who hasn't been to any of them so far. Yeah, it's going to be an educational session from the who gets to vote or um, it, or I'm sorry, the um, voice of the experienced as much as it is going to be us uh, talking about Uggen and Manza because like we'll provide the history part. And they're going to provide the recent history part and like they've been doing here. Um, with that being said, uh, I guess hopefully I can see y'all next. Um, you don't have to finish the Uggen and Manza, of course. Um, you can just and uh, Voice of the Experience will be telling us a lot about what's happened in recent history.